It seems almost like we're code. Uh, there's a there's a programming code behind all of this in the sense, not literally, I'm saying, but as a an analogy, yeah. there is the code of our bodies. What and then the DNA, and then if you want to start getting into a little bit more metaphysical aspects of things, karma and all these other aspects, generational karma. You know, why is there a mole in your back? Why can't you do this? Why? What's causing that? There's no reason. These, all this kind of coding, and it's all information. It seems like it's constant information moving in and out all the time. It really is. And I, I've been accused of being obsessed with hyphens because I write <laughs> in hyphen formation to really differentiate between some meaningless gobbledygook and mm. the meaningful information, which is the basic stuff of our universe, of the whole world. And as, as you say, Alex, you know, what this cosmic hologram model and that I continue to write about in the story of Gaia too, which is the evolutionary story of what that means, mm -hmm. is a meaningfully informed universe, which is also multidimensional. So it has levels of, of intelligence, archetypal intelligence, in, in both incarnate and discarnate forms. So it's a much grander, most wondrous, exciting um you know, story and, and a, a new and unitive narrative where, you know, everything in existence has meaning and evolutionary purpose, which means we do too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without question. I love what you're saying in regards to the multi multi-dimensional because this is one dimension, then the, you know, I've spoken to so many near-death experiencers and they have, they visited another dimension of some sort, out-of-body experiencers, um, channels other people talking and then if you go into the vedic texts they talk about like i think it's 49 levels of different uh consciousness that you can grow into ascended masters go to so you know and you, you constantly are evolving there's so much into it but now that the now that the scientists like yourself are starting to quantify it for us in a different way where it's not woo woo anymore Oh, really? we're getting farther and farther away from woo woo and getting more and closer and closer to reality and, and proof and evidence. But I have to ask you a question. This is a question because you've mentioned it a few times in our conversation time. Yes. Now my perspective on time is it yes. is a man-made object and our time is based around the rotations around our sun. If you leave our solar system, time does not exist in the way, and it's not going to be 12 o'clock somewhere. It's not going to be one o'clock somewhere. What is your definition of time in the scope of universal time versus yeah. our little our little 12 o'clock, one o'clock thing that we got going on here? Well, before I do that, before I forget, um, I love I love to say we're moving from woo woo to wee wee because this <laughs> oh, is all great. That's wonderful. I love that. <laughs> this is who we really are. Um, yes, I think this is a really common misunderstanding, if, if please, to, to, to honor that perspective. Because when Einstein um, realized that space was relative to the position of an observer and time was relative to the position of an observer, I think that wasn't his greatest genius. He continued to follow the evidence and what he followed it to was that yes, space is relative. Yes, time is relative of themselves, but we have to bring them together as invariant, what's called invariant space-time. So what he understood is when we describe an event, we can't just say three dimensions of space, yeah? We have to say three dimensions of space and one of time. And when we bring that four-dimensionality into a measurement, it doesn't matter whether we're making that measurement here on Earth, a galaxy far, far away in a long, long time ago, or wherever. And that invariance of space-time means that we can, as cosmologists, talk about a universe that began 13.8 billion years ago as that first tiny, tiny moment of an ongoing out-breath, an ongoing big breath, as I describe it. Mm -hmm. And the way that this works is that as space expands at every, you know, in the, at Planck scale area, 
and this is my new this is named after Max Planck who was one of the great pioneers but at every Planck scale time which is also minute more and more and more and more information is able to be holographically manifested within space time so we do have universal time otherwise we couldn't you know the laws of physics wouldn't work nothing would hang together right and but we also have this personal perspective of time you know einstein once said um and it was only he who could say this and get away with it probably that uh if you sit on a hot cooker a minute feels like an hour but if you're sitting with a, a, a beautiful young girl an hour feels like a minute now that's a personal sense of time yeah. But I'm talking here about the both and. Yes, and, 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 you know, our perspective of time, so much of our biology is based on our position, on our planetary home, going around our sun. But I'm going way beyond this and saying it's a both and, that as, as cosmologists, as, as humans, we can also understand that our entire universe is undertaking a journey of space-time where there is a universal time of, and it's one way flow and it goes mm. from the past to the present and at each moment we're at the bow wave of that here and now with the future still to unfold. To watch the full video, click on the link below and don't forget to subscribe.